very good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and uh, our dear colleagues so this is dr om prakash from akhan university hospital and with me today we have got three very distinguished and expert hepatologists with us dr amna suman she is uh, globally well known has been presenting her work and has done a uh, lot of presentation internationally recently she has done a, a very excellent talk in egypt as well dr faisal he is our associate professor at our university hospital he is very uh, he is the director of the endoscopy unit and has been involved in many uh, of the pakistani societies he is very lead in pakistan society for the study of liver disease and uh, dr kalash who is a faculty at dau university of health sciences he is a transplant physician he has recently done his transplant hepatology fellowship from university of toronto and myself i'm dr om prakash and uh, i'm a gastroenterologist at our university hospital and uh, working as a, a hepatologist as well as gastroenterologist so further without delaying further we need to move on our today's agenda so may i request dr faisal wasim to give his talk so as you know that we are uh, ce uh, celebrating this day as a world hepatitis day uh, the, which is scheduled to be on 28th of july as you know that the, uh, globally the world many country decided that the, they should eliminate the hepatitis by 2030 and we are 10 years below that time and there we are in the we uh, we as a pakistani are in the highest uh, burden carrier country so we need to work a lot with these you know with these kinds of uh, sessions campaigns conferences we put more pressure on our political leaders so that they should work with us to eliminate this menace so with this dr professor please share your screen and start your talk thank you very much dr om prakash i've shared my screen uh, can anybody tell me if that is okay uh, no i uh, we can't can uh, yes now it's coming yes we can uh, yes now you can see okay thank you so thank you dr om for that uh, introduction and you are also absolutely correct that uh, the this menace of hepatitis b and c can only be solved when we as healthcare professionals educate uh, not only the public but also our fellow colleagues who are involved in the management of hepatitis b and c so that we treat our patients better we prevent the disease better so that we can get rid of the disease uh, as soon as we can uh, i in the next 10 to 15 minutes have been given the task of talking about hepatitis b and d and as both and as most of my audience will know that these are very complex viruses and who themselves just parts of these their talks can be about 20 or 30 minute lectures so what i will be doing the next 15 minutes is just to go over the key concepts in the management of hepatitis b and d uh, particularly related to treatment and management because those are the questions that we hear most about where people are confused about i will not be touching on pathogenesis and pathophysiology because that is something you can read up but i will be reviewing current guidelines about treatment and management and follow up of these patients i do not have any financial disclosure to declare uh, we have all uh, be aware of this particular slide which tells us uh, how badly pakistan is affected with hepatitis b uh we also realize that currently we pakistan who is right here in this yellow areas in the 2 to 4% area uh of hepatitis b but we also realize that there are pockets of in our country in interior sindh and in parts of balochistan where the burden of disease is is very much higher now i want to introduce everybody to new nomenclature for the chronic phase of hepatitis b previously we used to be talking about immuno tolerant immune reactive inactive carrier and uh, both american associations as well as the easel uh, the european association for the study of liver disease has made things very much easier now and i would want you to concentrate on the fact that the first branching point for hepatitis b patients for chronic hepatitis b that is chronic hepatitis b is b surface antigen positivity for more than 6 months if that has been positive for more than 6 months then you can say a patient has chronic hepatitis b and when they do then you divide them broadly into two categories those who are e antigen positive and those who are e antigen negative 
and we need to remember that what is treated is chronic hepatitis b in other words patients who have chronic hepatitis b infection where there is no liver disease and there is no uh, rise in elt and a very high risk hbv dna are not usually treated we treat chronic hepatitis b so e antigen positive disease and in e antigen negative disease again the new terminology for treatment is that we treat e antigen negative chronic hepatitis b where there is moderate to severe damage in liver disease and there is a raised uh, dna level as well now there will be areas where i will be talking about where we do uh, break this rule as well but i will be talking about that but broadly i want you to consider that the new terminologies that are used of inactive carrier and immune tolerant are now gone patients now have chronic hepatitis b e antigen positive or have chronic infection and this is very similar where according to the new nomenclature where patients who have just infection have very high levels of dna but normally elt is no inflammation in the liver but as they go on to chronic hepatitis b they have a high raise in elt the dna levels may come a little down but this shows that there is damage going on in the liver and this needs to be treated and it's very similar in e antigen chronic negative hepatitis b where there is when there is damage in the liver and raised dna levels you will want to treat so key guidelines are that when you want to treat a patient with hepatitis b please remember not all patients with hepatitis b require treatment just because a person is dna positive does not mean please you need need to give treatment you will need to do liver treatment for hepatitis b depends upon three criteria which is dna levels alt levels and the amount of damage going on in the liver as evidenced by fibrosis or cirrhosis so the main end point is what you would really like to do when treatment hepatitis b is you want long term suppression of hbv dna and what's best would be that if you can have the antigen loss or zero conversion which shows active viral replication the other additional end point would be alt normalization but the optimal end point the best end point you can have for patients who who you treat for hbv is surface antigen loss which unfortunately with current medical treatment does not happen a lot and patients who should be treated like i said the primarily based on the combination of three criteria you will treat dna levels alt levels and the severity of liver disease where there is absolutely no doubt in treatment is when patients who have e antigen positive or negative chronic hepatitis b and they have cirrhosis if patients have cirrhosis based upon your ultrasound findings or or the bilirubin levels or the pt levels or the albumin levels then any detectable hbv dna regardless of treatment regardless of alt needs to be treated otherwise patients who have an hbv dna of very high more than 20000 international units and an alt that is twice the upper limit of normal can be treated regardless of whether they have any fibrosis on a liver biopsy or on a fibro scan in other words even if your fibro scan shows f1 disease if they have raised levels of alt more than twice normal and a dna of more than 20000 you will want to treat them for patients who are e antigen positive or negative if they have a dna of more than 2000 international units but they have moderate to severe disease on histology you will treat them even if the alt is less than twice raised so if you see liver damage and a dna of more than 2000 you want to treat patients who are will not be treated that is those those patients who used to be called immunotolerant and now called hepatitis b chronic infection if they if those patients who have low levels of dna 200 units 300 units no damage on a fibro scan or a liver biopsy a normal alt these are patients you do not want to treat in these patients you would need to keep them under follow up because they may switch in their disease course so you would need to follow them every 3 to 6 months So this is an algorithm I would want you to remember for chronic hepatitis B infection that is surface antigen more than 6 months if they are surface antigen positive and or if they are uh, E antigen positive or not so if they have chronic hepatitis B right over here where my arrow is then you would look at their surface antigen E antigen and DNA levels and if they have chronic hepatitis B infection then you would just monitor them but if they have chronic hepatitis B and cirrhosis you would start antiviral treatment likewise if they are surface antigen negative and core positive then you do not need to follow these patients up but remember if you need to give them immunosuppression which is a different talk then you would need 
antiviral treatment. So treat antiviral treatment where it's required for patients with chronic hepatitis B if whether or they do not have cirrhosis. What do you treat them with? You would want to treat them with a nucleoside analog with a high barrier to resistance, which would mean that if you, even if you give them treatment for a long length of time, resistance nahi paida hogi. And those, those uh, preferred agents are intacivir, tenofovir, and tenofovir alafenamide or tenofovir diperoxyl fumarate. Uh, but the older agents such as lamivudine, adifivir, and telbivudine are not recommended and should not be given. And the reason why we give these is that you will see that for with entacuvir and tenofovir, uh, uh, and now with tenofovir alafenamide, we don't have a lot of data, but there is hardly any resistance that develops over a period of time. And that's why these medications are good. A lot of people either want to start off with tenofovir alafenamide or ask what is the difference. One of the main reasons, the, the, the advantage of alafenamide over tenofovir dipervoxyl is the fact that it affects GFR. Uh, in patients who have renal impairment, uh, TDF, tenofovir dipervoxyl, affects GFR a lot more than alafenamide. And this is seen for osteoporosis as well. So the only reason why you would choose tenofovir alafenamide or entacovir over tenofovir dipervoxyl fumarate would be if patients have bone disease or renal disease. Otherwise, it's okay to choose entacovir or TDF as well. When you monitor these patients uh, about three to six monthly, you would need to look at their HPV DNA levels. You would look at renal monitoring. And remember for all cirrhotics, HCC surveillance is mandatory. You would have to do an ultrasound and an alpha fetoprotein every six months because HBV can cause HCC at any point along its, uh, its treatment course. A lot of the times I get patients uh, who are told by their physicians uh, that is never the case. Uh, you've got to think twice or thrice before you start treatment. And if you do think of stopping treatment, there are and there are stopping rules. So you can stop nucleoside analogs if you've confirmed that there is surface antigen loss and you've got surface antibody positivity. You can think of stopping uh, so nucleoside analogs in E antigen positive care patients who do not have cirrhosis, who achieve zero conversion, which means they've become E antigen negative and E antibody positive, and after having no DNA positive, that, that means HPV DNA not detectable for more than 12 months, then you can consider stopping them. And they may be considered and also in E antigen negative patients who again do not have cirrhosis, who achieve more than three years of virological suppression. By and large, when we start patients, uh, when we start treatment of patients, we tell them that we're going to be giving it indefinitely and we do not know if we will be able to even stop the medicine. As long as that understanding is with your patient, you should start your treatment. Uh, for people who have nucleoside, uh, nucleoside analog failure, which happens very rarely, I just want to tell you that if your patients are resistant to telbividine, you can switch them over. Uh, I'm sorry, if they are resistant to dacavir, you can switch them over to tenofovir. And if they are resistant to tenofovir, you can switch them over to dacavir. But if you think that you're dealing with nucleoside and nucleoside analog failure, it would be best for these patients to look, be looked at by specialist hepatologists and not in general practice. Uh, remember, pegylated interferon is not completely out, but it's hardly ever now prescribed for HPV. You can consider it initial treatment for patients who have moderate, mild to moderate disease only. For example, in preg uh, ladies who want to get pregnant and do not want to take long-term treatment, uh, the standard uh, interferon is given for 48 weeks, uh, but, but it's something that we now use extremely rarely. Uh, for decompensated cirrhosis, you would never want to give pegylated interferon, but please remember as soon as you, for cirrhosis and for decompensated cirrhosis, as soon as you have seen that they are DNA positive, you do not even need to do a quantitative DNA in these patients. Even a qualitative DNA which shows it's positive, you should start treatment for life with either intacuvir or tenofovir, depending on the guidelines that I've told you, and you can start them for long-term for life treatment. I will quickly, in the next few minutes, uh, in the interest of time, move on to hepatitis delta, which is a big problem and a curse in certain parts of our country. Unfortunately, hepatitis delta is, uh, is a complication that's seen only with hepatitis D. We know that about 20 million people are infected worldwide, and it causes the most severe form of chronic viral hepatitis. 
And the problem is, if you don't test for it, you will never treat it. Uh, you will never identify it. So you've got to treat it as well <coughs> by testing all patients with hepatitis B for HDV antibody. And if those are positive, then with a PCR test. It's a dynamic disease. And the problem is that the damage happens in the liver, not only because of B, but also because of D. Uh, migrant population and special risks groups have been shown to be IHDV prevalent, but the special risk groups include IV drug abusers and hemodialysis, where there is direct access to bloodstream. And in this, the HDV, HDV genotype matters. Now, uh, it's always found in association with HB infection, because if you remember, this is a defective virus, which would mean that it's incapable of reproducing alone. It needs the core of HBV to, to surround it, to, to uh, replicate. Um, and the most commonest routes of infection are intravenous, percutaneous transmissions, and sexually transmitted routes. Pakistan, at this point in time, occurs in the intermediate range. But you, this would be this data is really alarming for us. That if we would look, that there are areas in India just next door who are reporting 15%, but there are pockets in Pakistan that are reporting 35%. 45% of all HBV patients have DNA, and these are pockets in Jafarabad, in Jacobabad, in uh, uh, Rahim Yar Khan and uh, other areas which are called the HDV belt, where there are massive load of HDV in Pakistan. And we can see that as we've started to recognize this and the rate of uh, testing is increasing. So we're trying to, we're seeing that there are uh, very high ranges of HDV being detected as well. HDV can be a co or a super infection with hepatitis B, a CO would mean that they have both got together at the same time. HBV and HDV enters the body at the same time. And usually what happens is that as HBV is cleared, HDV is cleared as well because the HDV cannot uh, survive without HBV. More of a problem is the super infection that happens, which means that a person who has already chronic hepatitis B and already has some liver damage is super infected with the HDV. And that becomes chronic in almost 90%. It's transmitted the same way as hepatitis B, that is sexually transmitted or vertical transmitted, and HVV prevention, vaccination will prevent it. Uh, but what's important is in this slide that virtually all bad liver disease progression happens with HBV. So there's more rapid production of HDV, more frequent complications of LCD, and more frequent thrombocytopenia. So it's clearly much worse. Unfortunately, there is not a lot we have to offer in terms of treatment for Hep D. The only thing in initially interferon used to be given, but now we just have pegylated interferon, which only causes a, a viral a virological response in up to 30 to 40 percent of cases. That means two thirds of your patients will not even respond to your interfer pegylated interferon treatment. When you do give treatment uh, for hepatitis D, your goal is eradication or suppression of HDV replication. Uh, treatment is given with pegylated interferon for 48 weeks, although there are many studies to show that even 96 weeks is given. A lot of the times we do increase treatment duration for Hep D, and the reason for that is there is nothing else to offer. There is absolutely no other treatments to offer. Uh, uh, and a nucleoside analog uh, therapy can be considered with also with HBV replication. And uh, uh, the other prospectives we have for HDV are other interferons, such as interferon lambda, albuferon, which is interferon combined with albumin. These are, at this time, all uh, research molecules. There is a lot of data about mercurodex and prelination inhibitors, such as lunarafenib. These two agents, mercurodex, which are inhibitors of HPV and HDV uh, penetration and prenylation inhibitors, are two that you would want that these will probably be coming up in the near future but right now they are not part of any guidelines and pegylated interferon is what we have so to conclude uh, my talk uh, i'll say that hdv infection plays a very important role in the liver disease in parts of the world various but especially for pakistan all surface antigen positive need, patients need to be treated for anti hdv using serology and then confirmation with pcr the outcomes are uh, bad because it's rapid progression to cirrhosis and stage liver disease. Pegylated antiferon has been used to treat, but there is currently no very good treatment for HDV. Good mm -hmm. hepatitis B control is possible with current nucleoside analogs. So long-term treatment and follow-up is essential. And prevention with the vaccine is key to both hepatitis B and D. Thank you very much.
excellent dr faisal wonderful talk and now uh, we move on to another uh, talk uh, dr amna subhan please uh, share your screen all right uh, so thank you very much uh, so can you see my screen yes all right uh so assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen and uh, the task which is given to me is to talk about hepatitis c uh the findings and the main road map in 2020 uh so the topic is quite extensive and the information available about this subject is huge but i'll try to actually focus for the relevant topic which is like pertinent for the people who are primary health care providers as well as the people who are in touch uh, you know, who are actually treating these type of patients uh, in their routine uh, daily practices uh, so i think we all know that this is one of the um, one of the highly um, one of the disease in gi and liver diseases which is affecting a good number of people worldwide 71 million people globally and unfortunately this eastern mediterranean area is affected uh, most as compared to the other part of the world and uh, if just see the number of cases present worldwide affected because of hepatitis c so even after egypt pakistan is facing the second highest prevalence but again the number of cases are quite large as compared to other parts of the world and unfortunately 200 million to 90 million people are living with this viral with viral hepatitis like b and c but they are unfortunately aware unaware of their condition this simply means that nine out of 10 they don't know about their diagnosis and because of this um they not only receive diagnosis at the later stage of the disease they receive care um very late sometimes they do not have access Uh, to the treatment um, uh, available, and that is why the burden of this hepatitis C as well as B is actually increased over the last couple of decades, and resulted in a very high burden of disease worldwide. So, in 2016, WHO estimated that around 3,399,000 people have been died because of hepatitis C, and mostly because of cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. and antiviral therapy is actually can cure more than 95% of patients if it exists in modalities of the treatment provided that they receive is actually on time so what is the situation in pakistan these are the old numbers the survey has been conducted in 2007 and 8 uh, where approximately 4.9% of uh, individuals in pakistan has been found to be affected because of hepatitis c which was around 7.8 million of pakistani population now these numbers over last decade has been increased further it looks like that uh, but again if this has been increased more than this number especially in a high prevalent area then this is an alarm for us but again this is like around a decade older so considering the the significance of this disease the who and the various other authorities is actually they started various campaigns and moving the focus about the treatment as well as the elimination of hepatitis c and the goals were like 65% reduction by 2030 which is pretty ambitious or a very very high goal and uh, especially for the countries where the facilities available are limited and access to the health uh, care and the management is like not that good where the existing healthcare facilities and the systems are not that good developed where the people can access the treatment but definitely one can actually uh, try uh, to achieve this target globally but this seems like a very ambitious one but at least if one third of this target could be achieved for a country like pakistan it will be a huge a success at our end so there are certain gaps in our daily practices for instance um the approximately 50% of cases uh they remain they when they have been diagnosed they were not aware of their status and approximately 43% of cases uh where they have been diagnosed their access to the outpatient care uh just only the access to the outpatient care was available just only for 43% of cases and out of all these cases 16% cases they received treatment and only 9% were cured So this was the data in 2014, which was a grave situation. So the situation seems to be better, but definitely we don't have data available for Pakistan. We assume that 
the the availability of uh, low cost medications and easy to use medication has actually provided better uh, access to the therapy as compared to an interferon uh, era so by looking at all of these facts now this is very very clear that treating these patients is not the solution identification of patients who are asymptomatic carrying the disease and again identification of those patients who are not having an active virus but they may be a source of a spread in the community is another key uh, towards the elimination so the clinical strategies which actually we can adopt for achieving an hepatitis c elimination it actually includes the simplification of diagnostics as well as the treatment algorithm making it more simple especially if people can actually uh, avoid it in the remote area uh, integration of hepatitis c treatment with the primary care and other disease programs decentralization of hcd services to the local and uh, local uh, level and sharing of hepatitis c care with the more as well as treating and um, as well as, um, uh, providing an opportunity for the people for example the primary care health providers secondary care health providers who can treat so other than other than the treatment when and how to screen for hepatitis c should we, should we test a real person who's coming, in, for example, the dyslexia who's coming for, uh, for instance, some other problem to your clinic? So the recommendations are the people who are baby boomers, which means that they have been born between 1945 and 1965. Um, they should be screened. Oh, this is the era where the safe screening of the uh, transfusion services was not relevant. And again, the testing realities was not relevant because hepatitis C was actually identified later on in the 1970s and then early 80s, the tests were widely available. So all the baby boomers, if uh, uh, if they are accessing you, better to screen them. And after that, the people who have certain risk factors, they should be screened for hepatitis especially if if even more for example, the people who have history of illicit drug injections or intranasal illicit drug use, the history of the people who have been on the diagnosis or who are going for the dialysis, the people who have uh, experienced tattooing um, as in real, healthcare workers, children, they have been able to entire assist public and mothers, while carrier, history of health transfusions uh, and organ transplantation before 1992. Uh, this is a global recommendation, but actually for Pakistani population, the people who have received blood transfusion whenever, I think they should actually also be screened for hepatitis C. Because we know that the safe transfusion practices, um, especially, especially a decade ago, were not actually available everywhere in Pakistan. So for us, it will be quite practical if we will be screening people who have received any blood product transfusions ever in their life. So the people who have been incarcerated whenever uh, HIV infected patients come with disease, hepatitis, because of an unknown cause, including people who have um, who have elevated their enzymes without any symptom. So what is what after that? Uh, if if somebody is like an high HIV, you have tested it, you have to stop them, guide them about, educate them about the preventive measures for hepatitis C. Somebody who's having a positive hepatitis antibody, then However, they also get educated about uh, the, 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 the fact that they can actually transfer the disease to other patients. So the preventive measures should be advised to them. If hepatitis C is uh, SCV or NA is actually positive, it means they are infected patients and then if you are uh, eligible to provide them, you can treat them or otherwise you can refer them. So what will be guiding them? So for the prevention of hepatitis C, whether they are carrier, whether they are infected because of hepatitis C, advise them to avoid carrying a group food which actually can do some bleeding. For example, their toothbrushes, their shoes, and their nail cutter, by using which they can have small amount of bleeding incidentally, those equipment or those uh, things should be avoided. Prevent the blood from that group that uh, blood ever, even if they are carrier. 
they avoid illicit drug use, the risk of sexual transmission is with monogamous couple is low, but definitely the people who have high risk behavior, they should be warned about this transmission. So this is the guy, uh, so the counseling about reducing the progression of liver disease which simply means that they should be tested with content as to hepatitis B, ideally for HIV as well. Evaluation for advanced fibrosis, update methods in terms of hepatitis B, and uh, if the history of alcohol use, if there is a history of alcohol use, so then that this will actually bring an additive injury to the liver, we should ideally exclude from the alcohol. And now we know that the data is coming that no, no amount of alcohol is safe for the liver. So what is the simplify algorithm for the people who are primary or secondary healthcare providers? It's very quite simple. So in initial assessment, do a physical examination, look for the stigmata, for liver disease, look for extra hepatic manifestations, and the blood test which will be required at baseline to do CDC, liver function test, albumin, creatinine, hepatitis, physiology, and the resources antigen, and ideally HIV as well. Um, American Association for the Study of Liver Disease also recommends for hepatitis A hospital, uh, which may or may not be applicable for us. If you look at our previous data about the prevalence of hepatitis A, more than 90% of children, when they reach to a teenage, they have been exposed to hepatitis A. So this is actually applicable for our people. Look at the platelet count, look at for non parameters for a cirrhosis, and according to that, you can decide about the treatment. Um, if you're a primary healthcare provider or if you're a secondary healthcare provider, so look for other parameters. For instance, if they have concomitant hepatitis B or hepatitis, uh, HIV, or if they have chronic, uh, chronic kidney disease, and especially if their uh, GFR is less than 30, it's better to refer them to a specialist rather than treat them um, in a remote territory. Uh, uncontrolled comorbidities, for example, skin cancer, somebody who's on, on immunocompromised treatment, somebody who's an organ transplant uh, recipient, they should be actually referred to an specialist. Also, the people who have decompensated chronic liver disease, thrombocytopenia, and advanced fibrosis, they should be actually referred to a uh, specialist for the further treatment. Because these are the patients who would require some customized uh, treatment depending upon the patient's clinical condition. So the other very common question is, should we test for genotype in all cases? So in interferon era, it was better to, it was actually recommended to test for genotype because the duration of the treatment was different. But with the provision of the pen genotypic uh, treatments available, including at Pakistan, it is not mandatory for all cases because uh, checking the genotype is actually increased the cost and it actually may uh, bring some delay, some complexity. So if the pen genotypic regimen is available in your country, like in Pakistan, we do have options, you may avoid checking. You can actually uh, leave it, checking the genotype in all cases. However, it should be checked for the patients who have been treatment experience, especially for example, they have received some kind of DAA or interferon combination therapy, or uh, who have some cirrhosis and already being treated. Um, so while well, again looking for the checklist, uh, as I said that the fibrosis assessment should be done and you can do a fibrosis assessment by checking non-invasive parameters, for example, by simple, by checking at the, uh, the evidence of cirrhosis on ultrasound, by doing fibro scan and non-invasive parameters like fit for score or every index you can, these calculators are available online and you can actually Google it and you can calculate it. Uh, you'll be thinking about the regimen which you'll be using for that patient and the duration. And you should also take care of the comorbidities, for example, the presence of chronic kidney disease, presence of co-infections, drug to drug interaction, which is again very important, and ongoing exposures, risk, for instance, the drug use, high risk behavior in terms of sexual uh, activities, as well as the concomitant use of alcohol. Um, so for hepatitis B, this is again very, very important aspect, which actually at many times uh, we ignore, especially when the DAA therapy era is actually started. So afterwards, when uh, the, uh, the DAA-based therapies were actually experienced by many people, um, so the people actually identified objectively the reactivation of hepatitis B especially even in patients who have been have been surface antigen positive and they have low viremia, even if they were carrier. 
And in case of inactive carrier, the reactivation has been reported in 24% of cases. Uh, so the people who have hepatitis B core antibody positive, DNA negative, surface antigen negative, so reactivation hasn't been documented um, until recently, but the patient who are inactive carrier, um, the reactivation has been reported to them. So this is important that to screen the patient for hepatitis B, and it's better to vaccinate them when you are starting them on therapy. The second area which is actually important when you are starting on the therapy is drug to drug interaction. And uh, uh, the and it is amazing that even it actually these medications have interaction with very commonly used medications including omeprazole, esomeprazole and uh, H2 receptor blockers and with antacids and all. Uh, so the life threatening uh, drug to drug interaction has been reported with certain drugs especially antiarrhythmic drug for example on. So these things should be avoided when the patients are getting antiarrhythmic, especially anti-amiodarone. So uh, we need to actually either, uh, based upon the indication, either they need switching of amiodarone to some other medication or wait for a time period when the physician is actually will be deciding to um, taper the dose of amiodarone, especially in case of paroxysmal ACID. But the concomitant therapy should be avoided. And now there are very good websites available to check drug to drug interaction. If you, if you forget about drug to drug interaction, don't uh, get panic. You can very easily check all of these interactions by just uh, checking at the websites uh, by doing a simple Google search. Now, what do we have in our toolbox uh, for the treatment of hepatitis C? So, there are many uh, very good direct anti antiviral therapies that are available, which includes NS3 protease inhibitors. And which include grisoprover, um, retinover, semaprover, um, glicoprover, and spike air application uh, complex inhibitors. Um, I'll just mention the name of those which are available in Pakistan so that you can easily remember. It will include deflexover and verpexover, uh, spike B nucleoside inhibitors, which include sofisprover, and is by NS5 B non nuke inhibitor, which include. Uh, the uh, so out of all of these medications, what is available in Pakistan? We have three drugs, Deglexover, Velpetsover, and Sofisprover, which is widely available, and the uh, older medication, Rabavarin, which could be given in combination. So the goal for the treatment is to reduce all cause mortality and liver-related adverse consequences of this disease, including mortality and progression towards end-stage liver disease and prevention of hepatocellular carcinoma. So the recommendation for when and whom to initiate, ideally everybody should be treated, uh, except for those patients who have short life expectancy and the people who have advanced decompensated cirrhosis and who cannot actually go for liver transplantation, these patients will be very high risk and probably the benefit will not be much. Here you should not opt for the treatment, otherwise uh, potentially everybody is a good candidate for the treatment. So uh, so uh, most of the medications are pangenotypic, especially um, for example like the Velpetsover and Sofasbaver combination. So these are the various combinations available for different genotypes. Uh, now let's see what is available in Pakistan and what we can give actually for how much time period. So if somebody is not having a cirrhosis, then you can give sofasbuvir and velpexavir therapy for 12 weeks. And for patients who have compensated cirrhosis, again the treatment is same, which is 12 weeks. So the patient who have genotype 2 and 3, this is in case you have checked it. So the treatment is actually same for both, which is 12 weeks. See, so. Even if you don't know the genotype, so the regimen and the duration is almost same. So for the genotype 4, again, you can treat with sofasbuvir and velpetsovir for 12 weeks. For genotype 5 and 6, sofasbuvir and velpetsovir for 12 weeks. However, if somebody is in a country where other medications are available, then definitely the first line therapies, as mentioned in the sequential way in this table, they should be adopted. And the medication, the dosage has been, uh, I, I mentioned dosage over here. For example, albisovir, this is 5 milligram once a day, grisoprover, this is 100 milligram, and likewise, the other medication, ledisprover is actually 90 milligram. But probably you just need to remember those medications which are available in Pakistan at the doses. This will be sufficient for you for now. 
uh, what about for those who have decompensated cirrhosis? So those who have decompensated cirrhosis here, uh, those who are rubber bearing eligible, you can actually use a combination of sofespaware with velpetsaware with rubber bearing for 12 weeks. But if these patients are not rubber bearing eligible, then extend the duration to 24 weeks. Uh, for genotype 1 and 4, you can use sofespaware and declatsaware, and regimen is again within the doubt rubber bearing. You can, use, you can give them for 12 weeks or 24 weeks. So what about for those patients who have decompensated cirrhosis but genotype 2 and 3 if it has been checked at some point but remember for decompensated cirrhosis it's better to take genotype and accordingly you can decide about the treatment. For genotype 3 you can give sofespaware and velpetsoware for 12 weeks and again declatsoware and sofespaware for 12 weeks. So these combination you can use. Um, so for ribavirin eligible patient, but if they are not ribavirin eligible, again, you can extend them for 24 weeks. So what about for those patients who have uh, kidney disease, for example, stage 1, 2, or 3? So, uh, so no dose adjustment is required if you are using, for example, decletsoware, um, albisoware, and grisoproware. Again, these other combination which are mentioned over here, but unfortunately, many of these combinations are not available in Pakistan. So what we can do? So we can follow over here easel recommendations where it's supported that if the treatment, which is the, for example, these and these medications, medications are not available here in these areas, sofaspaware and velpetsoware could be given to the patient, but we need to counsel the patient for that, that the first line therapy is not available. These drugs so far based upon case series, it could be given, but frequent monitoring about the adverse effect are needed. Uh, Ribavirin should not be given to the patients who are dialysis dependent. Um, and again, so what about during pregnancy? So during pregnancy, the treatment is not recommended because of like uh, no data, no trials are available so far to ascertain the safety of medications. And again, for these patients, once they have delivered, um, again, if there is no cirrhosis, you can wait. And after the lactation, you can start them on the treatment. Um, so what about if somebody had hepatocellular carcinoma has been treated and is not having any recurrence for next six months, then these are the patients who can be treatment using the standard of therapy, whatever is available in your country. So how to monitor them during the therapy? So during therapy, uh, CBC, creatinine level, especially if somebody is having non-dialysis dependent uh, uh, CKD and you are giving medications, you can monitor them uh, after every four weeks. Uh, PCR testing you can do at the end of treatment. This is a question that can, well, should we check actually at the four week or not? Um, there are data available which actually supports that 90, 90 plus percent response rate because of that you may not actually need to check the response at four week of the therapy and you can check at 12 weeks. But if the cost is not issue, you can check. Otherwise, you can check the PCR at the start of the treatment at end of end of the therapy and for SVR 12, which means that after the 12th week of the therapy, you need to check the response to check for whether the patient is having some relapse or not. So after the treatment, how you should follow if they have achieved sustained biological response at week 12. Um, people who do not have any cirrhosis, then they do not require very long-term follow-up. But if somebody is actually uh, who is having cirrhosis, they require a long-term follow-up. And I'll come to that, how they will require a follow-up. So the people, who do not, uh, who have some existing liver disease, for instance, because of hepatitis B with concomitant hepatitis C, follow them as per the treatment protocol of hepatitis B, as per the treatment protocol of, uh, for example, if they have underlying concomitant metabolic syndrome plus minus NASH fatty liver, then you should follow accordingly. Uh, those who do not receive in biological response and you do not have any therapy available further to treat them. So follow them six monthly until the newer therapies are available in your uh, locality. For those who have sclerosis, six monthly follow up with ultrasound and alpha fetoprotein, evaluate them for the presence of, for, for early detection of a carcinoma. 
evaluate them for the for the presence of a portal hypertension and esophageal varices by doing an endoscopy however the patients who have ongoing risk of reinfection because of hepatitis c for example in case of iv drug abusers for example in case of patients who have high risk behavior they require frequent monitoring uh so another area which is important for the patients who are providing customized treatment especially at tertiary care hospitals that treatment concomitant treatment of hepatitis c for the patient who have who are immunosuppressive therapy and receiving chemotherapy so now there are a, 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 the the evidence is available in the form of case series and all that you can treat them uh during chem if they are receiving chemotherapy especially if the baseline viral load was very high otherwise there could be actually further worsening of uh, acute hepatitis c during chemotherapy for the patient who have lymphoma uh there is always a debate that can hep c lead to lymphoma from lymphoma develop in certain cases or not it's a risk factor for that so these are the patient where treating hepatitis c seems to be like beneficial um so in summary hepatitis c assessment and treatment now are very simple and this is actually i would say a breakthrough discovery of uh, uh, this century uh, getting these effective medications and easy to use medications available uh, for the treatment of hepatitis c so assessment can be limited to the fibrosing staging um, if re uh, uh, concomitant evaluation of hepatitis b and hiv drug to drug interaction these are important and these are the neglected area many of us do not check especially for hepat hiv and drug to drug interaction but we all should remember that we should not miss these aspect genotype testing limited to the treatment experience patient and those who need uh, who have cirrhosis but for other you can actually um, uh, you can leave it so, so the pen genotypic regimen is available for most of the patient if not for all but for the most of the benefit patient with 90% uh, uh, at least more than 90% uh, success rate with the treatment on treatment monitoring limited to those who have adherence concerns um post treatment follow up will be required especially for those who have underlying cirrhosis and uh, for those who do not achieve end of treatment response so but remember now in 2020 the site treatment micro remuneration is very important area and this is a responsibility of all healthcare providers to early identify patients who are carrier infected and treat them and educate them for preventing cancer to hepatitis c i thank you all for your kind listening thank you very much uh thank you very much amna it's a excellent and wonderful talk as always so the next speaker is uh, doc uh, kailash he's a transplant physician is going to give us a talk on the transplant hepatology dr kailash over to you please share your screen thank you dr om and uh, the panel and gets from uh, for taking me on board for this presentation as i have been assigned for to present for liver transplant i think uh, this is a big topic and a subject in itself and i will try my level best to compile it in 10 to 12 minutes and uh, my target here is to make more people aware regarding liver transplant and i will not be going into the science though i have touched but i will try to be concise simple and very brief so i have no financial disclosure and no conflict of interest i will just start with a clip which might attract uh, the audience let's go So this is here we go. So liver transplantation. I and most of the transplant surgeons and transplant hepatologists and most of the transplant centers in the world believe that transplant any organ is the gift of life. Why do I say that? It is really the gift of life because when a patient gets exhausted, when a physician 
gets himself exhausted when the family has no hope then the only ray of the hope becomes the transplant so i personally believe in this that liver transplantation is the only gift of life one can give to another person last year uh, dr rizgar a transplant surgeon has uh, written a book in which he has very nicely written that in every other area of the medicine we spend our lives trying to fight of the death but transplant is totally different in this field death is our starting point if you see when we get a patient for liver transplant evaluation he's he's just messed up with all the all the issues he has ascites he has presented with multiple episodes of gi bleed which has required interventions he has history of encephalopathy in the past or he can have at present so the starting point first becomes the death and from there we go on forward in this picture i have tried best how this gift really works mark and david were two really strangers to each other and mark gave a part of organ a part of liver to david and now they both are no more strangers even last year they climbed mountain side by side so this is how liver transplantation makes difference in life when i talk about science a bit scientifically speaking and uh, i am not going into the details of this liver transplantation is replacement of a diseased liver with a healthy liver from another person it can be living donor liver transplant or diseased donor liver transplant unfortunately we are way behind the western world that's very unfortunate to us it may take many many years from now onwards that liver transplant will be an option in every city or at least in every province when i talk about the causes why and when to transplant i will i will suggest you to remember that whenever a patient develops end stage liver disease acute liver failure acute and chronic liver failure or hcc don't remember other causes or primary causes related to all these just remember all these this these four these four become really the the indications for transplant i'm going into the re- details of each one so when we talk about the indications there are a long list of indications with the passage of time this list is growing day by day and uh, as i mentioned acute liver failure due to any cause viral hepatitis is very common in our part of the world so whenever a patient is having viral hepatitis he becomes drowsy please think of acute viral hepatitis related acute liver failure he or may he or she may need liver transplant at some point in time i am not i am not saying that he will definitely need but he may need so whenever patient is in acute liver failure he can require transplantation he can be candidate for transplant a uh, jumping to end the story of cirrhosis as dr amnam and uh, dr pesel mentioned have b and c can cause chronic hepatitis and can ultimately lead to end stage liver disease so whenever a patient becomes infected with the viral hepatitis they are at more risk of becoming chronic they can lead to chronic liver disease if untreated and when this chronic compensated liver disease transform into end stage liver disease that becomes the point where we have to transplant other causes related to transplant could be metabolic disorders originating from liver malignancies it's not only about the hepatocellular carcinoma it can be cholangiac carcinoma hepatoblastoma fibroma hcc metastatic neuroendocrine tumors and many more to think there are certain criteria for liver transplant uh, for acute liver failure most commonly being used is king's college criteria and it's a very valid and has good prognosis now i want to i want to just tell the population the persons who are dealing with these patients 
about the decompensations. Most of us know what the decompensations are, but I want to say that whenever a patient develops upper GI bleed secondary to varices, ascites, which is intractable to medicines, requires large volume paracentesis and ultimately leading to tips and alpha pump, or when a patient develops encephalopathy, he has undergone multiple bouts of encephalopathy, or all of a sudden, very well compensated patient develops jaundice, then it alerts. Then we have to definitely think that something is going on and the patient needs to remain in touch with the liver transplant unit or liver transplant team. So here, here I can tell you what we have to consider in our clinics. First of all, we have to see if the patient's decompensated, is this decompensation reversible or not? Reversible in the sense there are a few causes which can reverse the decompensations, like alcoholic liver disease. When a patient is suffering from alcohol-related liver disease with decompensations and we ask for six months abstinence, there are two things to see. Either patient is very sober to the to stoppage of the alcohol and how does it respond? What's the response on stoppage? So the first question to us in a clinic should be, is this decompensation reversible or not? Okay, then the next question, if it's not reversible, is the patient suitable for transplant? Because once patient is decompensated, we don't have any other way to save this patient except transplantation. So if the decompensation, decompensation is not reversible, then think, is this patient suitable for transplant or not? The next question becomes, let's suppose, are there any contraindications to liver transplant? Then, the, then we have to see, is there any contraindication? We decided about the indication. Now, a contraindication. Is there any comorbidity which is precluding the transplant or not? If he, if he or she is having a comorbidity, then we have to see, is the comorbidity reversible? Can we intervene that comorbidity or not? If we can intervene that comorbidity, then yes, we have to go forward to the liver transplant. If anyone is in doubt while taking care of these patients, please seek advice from a local liver transplant unit. I know in Pakistan we have very minimal human resources related to liver transplant, but hopefully we will flourish. When we decided about the liver transplantation, there are scoring systems which have been ongoing, but these scoring systems mostly fit in disease toner programs. Why? Because patients compete with each other on these scores to get the organ first. When we talk about the living donor program like us in Pakistan, yes, these scoring systems let us know how severe the disease is, what's the mortality in coming three months, and how grave the prognosis could be. So this becomes an indicator. But what I personally think, when a patient becomes decompensated, irrespective of the score, right? I'm not saying the score should be very low and we should start evaluation not at all when there are particular indications irrespective of the, these scores then we have to think for transplant the very well known child pew score this also lets us know the treatment mortality higher the score early the mortality lower the score patient is in good hands except there are certain male exceptions this must be clear what the male exceptions are, basically, right? Uh, I want to make it clear when I was young, so I am, but when I used to appear in my exams, I used to remember the numbers, what the male exception points are particularly. Though for our fellows who are appearing in exams, I don't think it's very, very correct to remember the numbers because male exceptions are being run by the societies, by the local authorities who give particular acceptance to these exceptions. And these can vary from a region to region. And again, on the male exceptions, it's all about the competition between the patients. 
Contraindications. If you look, uh, if you keep into the past guidelines, this list was very huge. With the passage of time, this list is shortened. The absolute indications are very few nowadays. And I was very amazed when a patient came to me and somebody told him that this is a contraindication for a liver transplant. I was amazed. I was really amazed. So my, my, my message to the masses and the physicians is that Whenever you think there is transplant indication, let the patient be connected with the proper team. So the absolute contraindications are untreated HIV, severe extrahepatic diseases with predicted mortality of more than 50%, severe irreversible pulmonary disease, ongoing misuse of alcohol, active illicit drug use, and many more. This slide is very attractive for me. I have been a fan of this slide, at least. Uh, timing is very important for a transplant team. We really care about the time. It's not only about when to transplant, but once transplant is done, the timing matters the most for us. When to start and when to stop the immunosuppressives is the trick of trick. So we have not to transplant too early. We have not to miss the boat and it may be late. Liver transplant should be conducted in any patient with liver disease in whom the procedure would extend the life. What we have to think that either the liver transplant surgery will extend the life or not. Will the surgery improve the quality of life or not? These are the basic goals of transplantation. Once we decide this, then we hit. Patient should be selected if expected survival in the absence of transplantation is one year or less, or if the quality of life is unacceptable. Then the role of physicians is very important, very, very important, because we don't endanger the lives of patients. We have to extend the life. We have to improve the life, quality, the quality of life also. The main thing is to balance the boat. Balancing is the eight in which what we do, we compare either surgery will take the life or surgery will give the life. That's all about the liver transplant, I think. Once we get a patient, we evaluate the patient from hair to toe. Yes, truly speaking, it's a hair to toe examination followed by multiple consultations, basic and advanced laboratory. We take our infectious team and loop, cardiac pulmonary evaluation, age appropriate, malignancy, hepatic imaging, bone density metry, psychiatric evaluation, social work, nutritional assessment, financial and insurance screening. Transplant evaluation is not one man show at all. No. We have a lot of human, we need a lot of persons starting from nurse, nursing staff to a gastroenterologist to a transplant surgeon, ICU team, anesthetist, so on and so forth. Because every effort counts in transplant. What becomes the aim of the liver transplant assessment? How we approach? What drives in our minds? What goes through? We have to confirm the hepatological diagnosis first. Number one, the patient is really suffering from the liver disease or not. The next is to confirm the medical assessment, medical treatment has been optimized or not. It's not that if a patient develops ascites on the very first day and he comes to me, someone else, I, I will never say to start transplant evaluation. The medical management needs to be optimized once we are exhausted with all these options than a transplant becomes suitable. The next is we have to confirm that liver transplant is the most appropriate option for the problem. We also evaluate mental and physical health comorbidities. We have to consider the patient as a whole. It's not only about it's about the life. To identify any contraindications to ensure patients fully informed of liver transplant. 
how does it work? Once we evaluate our recipient, once he becomes a transplant recipient, we give him a green signal that, yes, please proceed. Then we ask him to find the donor. The donor criteria in Pakistan is risky family. The donor can't be from outside family. So he has to search in his family. Simply what we need, the blood group should be matched. Though at advanced centers, it can be varied. Then we proceed for donor assessment. Once donor assessment is done, a pair is matched, then we ask the family to come for conference. We meet them and discuss all the issues related to transplant surgery, perioperative care, post-transplant management, post-transplant, all the issues whatsoever comes in. Once we all become on single page, then we proceed the request for Human Organ Transplant Act office. And besides that, we also optimize our patient for surgery. Once HOTA gives approval, then Kailash, we discuss yeah. for the transplant Kailash, Kailash, I'm can just, you hear me? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, uh, kind request, please. Uh, you yeah, know that we are I'm ready, finishing. Ready I'm finishing. Yeah. yeah. Then post transplant care after post transplant, uh, after transplant, there's the post transplant treatment, evaluation, care, and many, many things. This is how COVID has hit us. Uh, we were doing very well till March. That pandemic and all these restrictions came in that evaluations went down, but slowly, gradually, we are stepping up now. Uh, COVID-19 and liver transplant, though, uh, I will try to skip that. COVID has hit us very hard, very hard. I think we are on the right track now, and we are skipping this bug. What's new for us in transplant? Hepsi positive organs. Hepsi is the old business in West. HIV positive organs being transplanted. No immunosuppression. I do remember a trial, litmus trial, and role of radiomics and artificial intelligence. In future, we may not need the biopsies for assessing rejection. So my message to the masses becomes, if you're suffering from decompensated chronic liver disease, please stay connected with your doctor and ask him or her about liver transplant. At least you should know what transplant is. Yes, though I'm a very passionate transplant hepatologist, by, but I still believe we can avoid transplant by preventing hepatitis. Thank you. Yes, I will finish it. Thank you very much, Kailash. Uh, thank you, uh, all presenters. Uh, you, you have done a very great job and uh, has done uh, justice to the presentation. So we have few questions, I think, in the interest of the time, I'm skipping my presentation. I have to go for my emergency procedure. So we will take just a couple of questions. So each questions to each uh, presenter. So first question goes with the Dr. Amna. Uh, so what should be done if FC patient positive with COVID-19? As expected. Yes, sir. <laughs> this was an yes. expected question so it's very simple okay so always you need to actually balance out the risk and benefit uh so the covert infection uh, the good thing about is like 70 percent six more than 60 70 percent of the cases they will be having a milder disease and they recover give them time to recover and then once they recover then you can consider the free treatment uh, so the question will be about those patients who have underlying chronic liver disease and now they have COVID, what to do with them? And again, if wherever the life expectancy is short, you do not treat those patients for hepatitis C. Remember, you are actually preventing them from the long-term sequela, not from a short-term any anything is actually the consequences of disease. So wait. You can wait for the treatment. However, you need to look for those cases who have underlying chronic liver disease, especially the decompensated cirrhosis or compensated cirrhosis, they may get deteriorated. And then you need to treat them as just to treat them other cases. COVID is one known factor for acute decompensation of existing chronic liver disease. Remember that. 
So whenever these patients are coming to you, whether they have Hep C, B, fatty liver disease, whatever, if acute they are presenting with acute decompensation, look for COVID as well, other than the other factors. Okay. So next question is uh, to Dr. Faisal. Uh, it's a little bit different. They're saying a differential diagnosis between hepatitis B and C and D. So it means can Sorry, Om, I could not hear what you yeah. said. Can you repeat your question? So this, I think this, there's a question that can you differentiate between these three types of viruses based on the liver function test? Okay. Uh, so the answer to the question is no, you cannot reliably differentiate between any of these viruses based on the liver function tests because we know that all three of the viruses will cause a hepatitis. And when that happens, the bilirubin may go up a little, the SGPT goes up uh, dramatically. So, and just based on that, you cannot differentiate between these three. You cannot differentiate between any of the other viruses as well. Uh, you have to do serological tests to determine what is the cause of it. And uh, so the, if you're suspecting chronic hepatitis, which means that the patient doesn't have too many symptoms, but he just come in with a test of deranged LFTs, then for chronic hepatitis, the first two tests that you do is a hepatitis B surface antigen and a HCV antibody. That's all you do for chronic hepatitis. And then depending on what this test shows, you then move on to do the other tests. If it's B positive, then you do B tests. And if it's C positive, then you do C tests. No. So I apologize for some reason. I think there's been a technical glitch that Ohms uh, uh, cannot, uh, we're not able to listen to Dr. Ohm. So, uh, so Dr. Kailash, is, Kailash, I'll have to uh, apologize. I don't think we have no the uh, question for you right now, but we'll have to now wrap up the session in the interest of time. We've also run ahead. Uh, what we can do is that if there are very important questions, please let the organizers know. They will get the questions to us and we will be able to answer them uh, if that is required but uh, uh, so okay the question i've just got a question very quick answer from you kailash yeah. there is the question is what is the life expectancy after a plant yeah very lovely question that is uh, a patient should definitely ask what the transplant expectancy is one year survival at the good centers varies from 90 percent to 93 percent and even in major centers of Pakistan also, it ranges from 85 to 90 percent. When I talk about five-year survival, it's around 75 to 85 percent. And I myself have seen a patient right having 35-year post-transplant survival. That's that's the way mm. forward. So. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, it remains for me to thank my colleagues, Dr. Amna Subhan, Dr. Kailash, and Dr. Om Prakash for sorting this out. Thank you to the audience. I hope you've had an informative session. Thank you to Dex Pharma for organizing this academic activity. Uh, I hope uh, we've been able to benefit you. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, if you have any further questions, you can get in touch with us. Thank you, and we have a very safe evening. Bye-bye and to the office. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.